Hi, everybody. I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today's live stream guest is going to be Raleigh lawyer and true crime author Stephen B. Epstein. So um, Mr. Epstein is actually a law partner at a firm called Pointer and Sproul in Raleigh. He's originally from Long Island, New York. He graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, first with a bachelor's degree in poli sci, and then with a law degree. He began as a law clerk to a federal judge and then also taught as a law professor at University of Illinois. So we are so happy to have Mr. Epstein as our special guest. His book about the Dan Markell case called Extreme Punishment is expected to be published and available in October. So um, I would like to first tell you guys about his website, which is his name, StephenBEpstein.com, where you can take a look at his bio and also learn more about the two other books that he's already published. And let us add Steve to the screen. Hi, Steve. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be with you. Sure. Yes. So um, I hope I sort of introduced you adequately enough because we have a bazillion questions that have already been posited by the subscribers. So you ready to dive right I'm in? I'm ready to dive in. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, so many people asked these types of questions. Was Wendy Adelson involved? Was Harvey, who will be charged or arrested next? And what do you think about Wendy's police interview? Okay, so obviously the whole Wendy issue is one that people have obsessed over since the day Dan Markell was gunned down in his garage. Um, and you know, I've watched the interview multiple times, five hours thereabouts with uh, Craig Isom at the Tallahassee Police Department. My impressions are those of a lawyer. And as a lawyer, I'm not trying to read whether somebody is telling the truth, overacting, uh, being too emotional, um, faking out the investigator. I look at objective facts to try and inform my decisions that's how I practiced uh, law for 32 years. And that's how I look at uh, the true crimes that I write about. And so I have a list of objective facts I'm going to share with your audience. And it'll kind of tip my hand as to what I think about um, whether Wendy herself was involved. We'll talk about the others in a minute. But this is Wendy is everybody's obsession, right? So um, so the facts supporting her involvement, um, she got to relocate to South Florida as a result of Dan's murder. She didn't have to deal with Dan anymore, and that had become a huge pain in her rear end. She didn't have to share the boys with Dan anymore. His murder ended the bitter divorce and custody litigation that had been ongoing. Uh, there was no logical explanation for her driving down Trescott Drive, where she used to live with Dan, at 1230 the afternoon of the murder. No logical explanation other than, hey, she was going to check out the crime scene, right? She went far out of her way to purchase that bullet bourbon, uh, there was a liquor store in the same shopping center where she was going to meet her two friends for lunch, and yet she drove miles out of her way and then drove back uh, basically to where she started, uh, all to get that bullet bourbon at a liquor store that had her routed through Trescott Drive. Um, and then there's who was going to watch the boys that night while she attended the stock the bar party that she was supposedly going to. So those are the typical things that people have come up with when they say, of course, Wendy was involved. Those are the objective facts. And I would agree, those objective facts all make you think, hmm, she must have been involved. There's a whole lot of objective facts that weigh on the other side, though. And the ones I'm about to read off are the pre-bump objective facts. And then we'll talk about post-bump objective facts. So she met for, with Craig Isom at the Tallahassee Police Department for five hours with no attorney present with her despite her full knowledge as a lawyer of her legal rights not to speak with law enforcement. Even asking him on one occasion, should I be read my rights? She said several times, I understand why I'm a suspect, uh, which seems incriminating for somebody to say. She told him how she had driven to the edge of the crime scene on Trescott Drive and seen the crime scene tape. She was the one who volunteered that information. She told Craig Eisen how angry her family was with Dan many times. She told him about Charlie's joke about the TV being cheaper than hiring a hitman, implicating her own brother, Charlie. 
She did not, despite what a lot of people think, she did not even mention Jeff LaCasse's name until her friend Jane McPherson was sitting with her in the interrogation room three hours into her interview. And it was Jane McPherson who brought up the name Jeff LaCasse, not Wendy. Her first words after speaking to her parents, Donna and Harvey, over the telephone while she was in that interrogation room, or her first words after hanging up with them were how relieved she was that they seemed surprised, noting how angry they were with Dan, which implicated them in what she was saying even more than she was implicating her brother. She voluntarily gave to the Tallahassee Police Department her phone so they could image it which included her entire call history and all of her texts, which were then in the possession from that day forward of the Tallahassee police. She allowed the Tallahassee police to search her minivan where they found the bullet bourbon that we've all talked about and the receipt showing where she had purchased it and what time. She allowed the Tallahassee police to take and image her laptop and what was found on her laptop, some of the most incriminating stuff in the entire case. Donna's vitriolic emails were found on her laptop and then embarrassing stuff like her searches for student teacher porn. She refused in those emails. Remember the emails where Donna was egging her on to do all kinds of things. She refused to do all of the things that Donna begged her to do so that they could force Dan to capitulate and allow the relocation. She didn't convert the kids to Catholicism or even threaten to. She didn't have them pose in front of a church. She didn't hire a Christian tutor. She didn't sign them up for Christian camps. And she didn't agree to participate in a bribe that would force Dan to allow the re relocation. If she wouldn't agree to those things to bring Dan to his knees that are much more tame than murder and not even illegal, why would she agree to be part of a plot to kill him? It makes far more sense that Donna and Charlie had concluded that Wendy wouldn't play along with their various schemes and that they therefore needed to take matters into their own hands without involving Wendy. Then finally, the last pre-bump um, issue that I'll highlight, which most people don't even know about, uh, Wendy's novel, This Is Our Story, uh, was selected to be uh, Florida's One Book, One Campus Award winner meaning that all 7,000 incoming students were assigned to read her book before the start of their school year. As part of that selection, Wendy was given the role of being the keynote speaker at the new student convocation, which was set for August, which was just a few weeks after Dan's murder. But because of his murder and because she moved back to South Florida with the kids, she didn't get to revel in that achievement and was replaced on the program in the new student convocation. My question is, would she really have given up the most significant achievement in her academic career to see her husband killed? And then we get to the post bump um, objective facts and they're significant. So Charlie, um, when he gets called by his mother immediately following the bump, Charlie asks Donna, does it involve Wendy? And Donna, his mother, says, no, 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 seven no's in response to Charlie's question, does it involve Wendy? And then immediately says thereafter that it probably involves the two of us, meaning Donna and Charlie. And then she says, you probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. They didn't meet the night of the bump. Why? because they were afraid Wendy would come to get her kids and they didn't want Wendy to know that they were meeting about this particular topic. And then there was a month of wiretap calls, dozens of calls among and between Donna, Charlie, Katie, and Garcia to figure out what to do about this man who seemed to be the blackmailer. There were no calls to or from Wendy. Why didn't Donna or Charlie involve Wendy if she was involved in the murder plot? makes it seem like she wasn't involved. Who did Charlie meet with before? I'm sorry, who did Charlie meet with before meeting with Katie at Dolce Vita? Yeah, so Dolce Vita is obviously a singular, an event of singular importance. Who did he meet with before going to meet with Katie? He met with his mom, Donna. He didn't meet with Wendy. And there was not a single mention of Wendy in that 41 minutes that we have of the enhanced Dolce Vita recording, not a single one. 
although Charlie mentioned Donna and Harvey on multiple occasions. So those are the objective facts. And I'll, as we go along, we can talk more about Wendy's involvement or her non-involvement, but there's a ton of objective facts that suggest she wasn't involved. Okay. As for Harvey, um, so there, there's been talk about this call that Garcia made, right, on July the 1st, 2014, but that's a red herring. Yes, he did contact Harvey's cell phone, but according to Katie's trial testimony and Yindra Mascaro's, um, that was not a call about the murder. That was a call about him being upset that he had just seen earlier that day, Charlie Adelson and his wife, Katie, um, going out with the jet ski. And that's when he had a confrontation with them. It was later that afternoon, Katie actually saw him with the phone in his hand and tried to yank it out of his hand. He ran away from her and he was leaving a message, a nasty message on what he thought was Charlie's voicemail, but it was actually Harvey's voicemail. Um, Katie's call to Harvey's cell phone was immediately thereafter. And according to Yendra Mascaro, Katie told her she was apologizing to Harvey Adelson for the voicemail that Sigfredo had just left. Again, it wasn't about a murder. It was about how upset Garcia was that Charlie and Katie were still dating. Immediately after the bump, Donna and Charlie they needed, agreed that they needed to meet separately away from Harvey to keep it a secret from Harvey. They actually said that to one another. Who did Donna say the blackmail attempt related to? Again, the two of us, not Harvey, just her and her son. Um, the next day, they met together deliberately while Harvey was at work, so he wouldn't know. And Harvey only found out about this whole thing because the undercover agent said a, sent a threatening letter to their Icon condo tower that was addressed to Adelson's. Harvey was the one who opened it. And then there's back and forth between Donna and Charlie on the phone indicating how upset Harvey was that he wasn't doing well after he had found that out. Um, in the dozens of wiretap calls um, that they were trying to figure out what to do about the blackmailer, not a single one to Harvey. Who ended up calling the blackmailer? Okay, so the blackmailer was actually called by Donna and by Charlie, but never by Harvey. So in answer to the question about Harvey, no, there's, it, to me, there's no objective facts that seem to indicate that he was involved and lots of objective facts that indicate he wasn't. As for Donna, the evidence is overwhelming. There are highly incriminating calls on the wiretaps. And not only that, who's the one who's stroking these checks to Katie? for 17 months, all the way up until Garcia gets arrested, it's Donna. Donna's the one stroking the checks. So that strongly suggests Donna's involvement. Everything about Donna's interactions with Charlie in the month or so following the bump strongly indicates her involvement. So I do believe Donna Adelson will be charged at some point. It's just a question of when the prosecution thinks it's strategically in their interest to do it. Uh, I do not believe Wendy or Harvey will ultimately be charged. That's okay. my very long-winded answer to that question. Okay. Well, can I interject and go off script a little bit? Absolutely. Um, okay. So getting back to July 1st of 2014, but how would Katie McBanua even have Harvey Adelson's cell phone? Because she wasn't even allegedly working at the Adelson Institute until after the murder. So, so it she she had visited over with um, Donna and Harvey on several occasions. She was Charlie's girlfriend. So mm -hmm. she had a relationship, not a great one, not a significant one, but she had a relationship with Harvey and Donna because she had been over at their place several times. So it's not terribly surprising that Charlie had given her his dad's telephone number. Not surprising at all. Well, I guess that's a possibility. But to me, you know, some woman dating some guy casually being his cheap fling, you know, I mean, what are chances that she would have the guy's father's personal cell phone number? But that's just me thinking, you know, I, I understand, you know, it can be explained. Um, the point also, is, is that um, Garcia did not have Charlie's number. Mm -hmm. that, that's the most significant thing. And as, as, if you'll recall, in the second yeah. trial, they made this big deal of, you know, there was actually a secret conspiracy that was solely between Charlie and Garcia. Well, that July 1st call to Harvey made very clear that Garcia didn't even have Charlie's telephone number. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I see. And then what about, what do you think of the alleged setup of Jeffrey Lacoste? Do you think that, you know, that, you know, perhaps Wendy did have a hand in setting up Jeffrey Lacoste to make it look like he could have shot Dan? Um, and also, supposedly, Katie and the hitman knew that the shooting had to be done no later than Friday because, you know, Dan was going to be leaving. Well, I'll take that question first. Um, okay. You realize that uh, Wendy was on the phone with her mother many times a day, and her mother knew literally everything that went through Wendy's head, Donna Adelson was well aware of because they were completely en enmeshed as mother and daughter. So mm -hmm. Donna would have clearly known about uh, Dan's schedule from Wendy. She probably knew about it. And they always were trying to organize when Donna was coming up to yeah. assist with the children. So the fact that Donna knew about Dan's schedule, not surprising in the least. It wasn't Wendy who had to inform the hitmen as to when they were supposed to do this. Donna knew that information just as well as Wendy did. Um, so in terms of Jeffrey Lacoste, um, remember this murder was supposed to have been done in June. Jeffrey Lacoste wasn't part of some setup in June. And these guys were going to kill Dan when they had an opportunity to do it. So the notion, and they came up a day before he was actually killed. So the notion that Wendy was trying to time Jeff Lacoste driving by Benton Hills or get the murder to be committed when she knew, like that doesn't make any sense because these guys were, we all know what um, Keystone cops kind of guys Garcia and Rivera were, were shooting a hole in the Prius um, all the crazy things they did with cocaine, alcohol, and everything else. The notion that they were going to precisely time to the minute, to the hour, whatever it was, when they were going to do this murder doesn't make any sense. And it's not consistent with anything Luis Rivera has ever testified to. They didn't know when they were going to do this. They were going to do it when they had the opportunity. So there was no way to orchestrate Jeff Lacoste driving by Benton Hills at exactly the right time. So I don't think Wendy was trying to set Jeff Lacoste up. Okay. And also in regards to Jeffrey Lacoste driving a silver Nissan Sentra, um, you know, I, I don't think any of the hitmen actually said that they were specifically told to rent a silver vehicle. I mean, I didn't know. Not at all. In fact, Rivera said that, you know, when he, when he said he needed to go a long distance, um, he was given the silverish green Prius, but, but he, he didn't ask anything about a color or type of car. He was going to get a hybrid because he was at hybrid auto rentals. Uh, but aside from getting a hybrid, he could have gotten anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't think that Wendy tried to set up Jeffrey Lacoste? That... I don't believe Wendy was involved in the murder plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think some people are kind of upset about that. I'm sorry they're upset, but I deal with objective facts. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's go down the list of humongous bunch of questions then. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, uh, did you already touch on this, like about her police interview? Do you think she was being honest? I, I you know, I, Wendy, um, and we'll talk about this some more. Wendy um, certainly has a way of slanting facts, um, and she did it both trials during her testimony. But whether she in that moment was slanting any facts, I really don't know. Um, but having watched her interview, there was nothing that was obvious to me that she was lying about. Uh, although, who knows? But again, the objective facts do not support her involvement in this plot. Okay. And um, I think you already touched on this about what they could possibly be charged with. And I mean, just based on my cursory review of some criminal law in Florida, it looks like there is no duty to warn someone of, uh, of someone's mm -hmm. plot to try to kill them unless there's some special relationship, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, but again, I, I don't think that's Wendy could potentially be involved if she helped cover things up after the fact. Uh, she could be charged as an accessory. Uh, Harvey could even be charged as an accessory. It's not a common thing that prosecutors do charge somebody that wasn't involved in a crime who are family members of those who were with being an accessory after the fact. But theoretically, they could be charged if there was evidence that they did affirmative things to cover up the crime. Uh, for instance, if, if Harvey knew that Donna was making those payments and had blessed her making those payments out of the Adelson Institute coffers to keep Katie quiet, could he be charged with being an accessory after the fact? He could. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about um, Katie allegedly telling Sigfredo that she already knew that the job had been done? 
you know, where people are thinking, oh, well, it must have been Wendy that then had transferred the message after she saw that Dan had most likely been shot because she saw the police tape and everything. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be the only thing that Luis Rivera is inaccurate about. So it, Luis Rivera says that's what he heard um, her say, but it wouldn't be the only thing that he, he's inaccurate about a lot of things. So uh, that could potentially be something that Luis Rivera is just inaccurate about or misremembered. Remember, he didn't do his proffer for two years. So, you know, who knows how much his mind we know about the drugs he was using, the alcohol he was using. Who knows how good his memory was on details like that? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. So definitely the you know, he could be thoroughly discredited to some extent based on his terrible memory and all his drug use and. He his... got a lot of things wrong. There's no question. Even, you know, Georgia Kappelman had a conceit. He got a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you talk about the immunity Wendy had or has from her two testimonies? One of the telling slip ups, of course, is turning on Trescott. Is there any way they can bring this in or is it off limits and cannot be used against her? Does this hinder the prosecution's case? Okay. Well, again, I don't think the prosecutors are ever going to bring a case against Wendy, um, but if they did, they couldn't use her testimony. She has use immunity and derivative Im use immunity, meaning they can't even go out and chase leads based upon what she testified to at either trial. Uh, so that's off limits. If she was untruthful about important things, they could potentially prosecute her for perjury, for being untruthful about those important things. Um, but you know the things she was untruthful about, like how much her family hated Dan, how wealthy her family was, and things like that, how bad her divorce was, those aren't the things that the prosecution is going to charge her with in all in all likelihood. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, OK, so I guess I probably know your answer to this, but somebody wanted to ask you, when will Wendy Adelson be disbarred? If you listen to both trials back to back in her police interview, every word out of her mouth was full of lies and carefully crafted sentences to mislead and manipulate her audience. And obviously she was under oath. Okay, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, again, in, in order to, even for disbarment purposes, in order to have some kind of negative consequence based upon sworn testimony, what you're, what the, what you're lying about or not telling the truth about has to be significant. So, you know, in the first trial, she testified she didn't turn on Trescott. In the second trial, she did. So, and that's a memory issue, uh, likely, because, you know, she, she was clearly committed to the fact that she had turned on Trescott. She told... Craig Isom that the day of the murder. So, you know, those are things that aren't lies to the point that you're going to be disbarred over something like that. I don't believe Wendy will be disbarred based upon any of her involvement in this case. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think so either. I mean, especially not having been criminally charged with anything. Right. If she's criminally charged and convicted, that's a different story, obviously. Mm hmm. Yes. And uh, was Dan Markell sanctioned in the divorce proceedings as implied by Wendy Adelson on the stand? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I When I heard her say that, I was like, seriously, you're saying that? I mean, she was, you know, minimizing him and diminishing him, uh, which was unfortunate, not nice, mean spirited. But that statement was absolutely untrue. Okay. Okay, next question. What does he think or, or what do you think are the chances of judges or politicians having some kind of sway on this case since there are indications that the Adelsons may be connected? Also, I'd like to know if the Florida bar. Okay, we already went over that. Okay, so, so I, I, you know, people were jumping on that bandwagon during the years in which no Adelson had been charged, believing that the reason they hadn't been charged is because of some political influence of some sort. I don't think that's true. I take Georgia Kappelman at her word. They were waiting for enough evidence to really have their best possible case since they only get to charge a criminal defendant one time and bring them to trial. And they did get better evidence against Charlie, and that's when they that's when they brought him in and arrested him. So I don't believe political influence was responsible for the delay in the arrest of Charlie Adelson. And I don't believe it's responsible for no other Adelson currently being behind bars. I think there will be a time that that comes for Donna. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. So some people in the chat are already saying that they feel like because you're a man that you are swayed by Wendy and that's why you you don't want to think Wendy is guilty of anything. No, you're going to hear about my emails with Wendy. Wendy's not okay. my favorite person in the world. And certainly what Wendy did to Ruth and Phil Markell and Shelly Markell and uh, Shelly's children is horrific. What, you know, keeping those children away from uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins for years. It's horrific, horrific. And then using them uh, just before this most recent trial so she could testify that you know, she had made arrangements for them to see him. Uh, it tells you a lot about Wendy. Uh, I'm not a fan of Wendy Adelson, uh, but I, my, my world is about objective facts. And there are very few objective facts suggesting her involvement in this murder plot. There are a lot of objective facts suggesting that she was not involved. Okay. Okay. So next question is, I'd like to know what his take is on the hung jury in Katie McBanua's first trial with all the evidence the state had. Okay. That's a great question. And um, I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs from chapter 25 of my book, Extreme Punishment. And that, par that chapter is called Civic Duty, and it's about the jury deliberations in the first trial. Um, and it's talking about the jury who hung uh, the juror who hung the jury. The holdout juror hadn't had a good night of sleep at all, tossing and turning in her uncomfortable hotel, hotel room bed. Over and over again, her mind had wandered to Ethan and Kaylee Garcia, whether their biological parents would ever again be involved in their lives was a decision now resting in her and her fellow jurors' hands. Not only did that make her decision incredibly weighty and consequential, she believed it also presented a searing moral dilemma. Though their life together had been hard scrabble for many years, by the time of Garcia's arrest, the holdout reasoned, the husband and wife had turned a corner, finally on the straight and narrow path. As best she could tell, Tuto's days as a criminal appeared to be behind him. He was even holding down an honest job for the first time. Regardless of whatever they might have done in the past, she believed, the longtime couple was now parenting their kids lovingly under one roof as fully contributing members of society. Under those circumstances, the young woman asked herself, was it morally and ethically permissible for the criminal justice system to yank Ethan and Kaylee's parents away from them forever, leaving them to grow up as orphans in foster homes? It was bad enough that Dan Markell's kids had to grow up without a father. What purpose would it serve, she wondered, to take another pair of innocent children's parents away from them? That moral conundrum was eating away at her as she tried her best to straddle the line between doing right morally and doing right legally. And I'll stop there. Um, I will tell you that this juror almost hung the jury on Sigfredo, despite the overwhelming evidence against him. She finally capitulated to the will of the other 11 jurors, but would not budge on Katie, especially because she was already sending Sigfredo off for the rest of his life. She did not want to send both parents off for the rest of their lives and leave Ethan and Kaylee as orphans, having nothing to do with the instructions Judge Hankinson had given them about how to weigh the evidence and decide whether Katie Magbanawa was guilty. Asterisk, caveat, you would think that, you know, this juror had done something horrible because she hung the jury based upon reasons that had nothing to do with Katie's guilt or innocence. Asterisk and caveat, had it not been for that holdout juror, Charlie Adelson would not be behind bars today. Why? Because that's what led the mistrial and the two plus years that followed the mistrial is what led to Georgia Kappelman and the state attorney's office redoubling their efforts to get better evidence for the second trial. And the most significant piece of better evidence was the enhancement of the Dolce Vita video. And it was that enhancement that led directly to the charges against Charlie and his arrest. So yes, that holdout juror did something that we can look back and say, that's not what she should have done, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise in the great scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I agree. Okay, so next question is, can you please clear up the confusion as to whether Rivera and Garcia really did see Wendy and the kids walking on the street on Trescott the day before Dan was shot? 
No, she didn't. They did not. Wendy was not there. It's one of the many things that uh, Luis Rivera got wrong. Um, whoever he and it may be that Garcia got it wrong, too. It may be that Garcia told him that's Wendy, but it wasn't. And they certainly didn't see Wendy with the kids who were in preschool. And in fact, there was a stipulation to that in both trials between the government and the defense that the, that never happened. Never happened. Mm -hmm. OK. I see. But it could have been that Sigfredo was mistaken. And Absolutely. Got he may have seen lady. somebody he thought was Wendy. And then there's this supposed call with Katie where Katie said, yes, Wendy's there checking out to make sure you are doing what you're supposed to do. But, you know, I, I have no idea how any of that could have transpired when Wendy Adelson was nowhere near Trescott Drive that, that day. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, all right. Next question. Do you think there was a chance Dan could have survived the shooting if EMS had arrived there sooner? And I know you're not a medical doctor, but do you have an opinion about that? He would not have survived. Um, he, so the testimony from the medical examiner was that the second bullet, the first bullet didn't kill him. Uh, in fact, it only went into his, into his cheek uh, and then lodged beneath his, ear, his um, eardrum. Uh, that bullet did not kill him. Uh, but that's the one that deflected through the glass of the windshield of the um, of the driver's side window. And that that picture of the window is the front cover on the front cover of the, my book. Um, and it also hit Dan, the bridge of Dan's glasses. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that one didn't hit the bridge of Dan's glasses. The second bullet did. The second bullet is the one that killed him. It hit the bridge of Dan's glasses and then went straight through his tear duct right where I'm pointing here. Um, and because the bullet was flattened, by hitting the glasses, it, it literally did all kinds of damage to his brain, causing massive hemorrhaging as it went from, from the front of his head all the way to the back through his brain. So he would have been brain dead no matter what, however quickly they got to him. He would not have had a normal brain function at all because of that second bullet. And that was within the minutes after he was shot. So the phone, the 911 call, which is actually how my book begins, it begins with Jim Geiger in his living room, having a peaceful morning and then going next door to see what happened to Dan. Um, the 911 call is part of chapter one and it's it's horrible uh, how long it took them to realize what was going on, um, but it really didn't matter at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you for that detailed explanation. I didn't, didn't know about that. Um, okay, so somebody else said, I wonder if Dan had any clue his life was endangered by his in-laws or former in-laws. They were in the same social networks. Um, I disagree with that, but I'm just guessing. And Charlie Adelson apparently made jokes about hiring a hitman often. It's hard to believe that friends of Dan and Wendy's didn't say, hey, watch out, Charlie is making some horrible comments. People gossip all the time, especially during brutal divorces. Yeah, I mean, it, so Dan had blind spots and Dan had weaknesses. Um, and one of his weaknesses was picking up on social cues. Uh, he didn't do that particularly well. And it's one of the several things that caused problems in his marriage with Wendy. Um, and lots of his friends have shared you know, stories with me about Dan's inability to pick up on social cues and, and blind spots. And he, he literally didn't see this coming at all. He had no idea how much his back and forth with Wendy in their divorce battle was grating on Harvey and Donna, and for that matter, Charlie, and how much he was really pissing them off. It, it didn't dawn on him at all. It dawned on some of his friends who he was talking to, but it didn't dawn on him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes you kind of wonder like if he was on the spectrum. A lot of professors are like that, you know, just not good at picking up on social cues and being stuck in their own little world. But the amazing thing about Dan was he had a circle of friends a, a, a mile wide and very deep. Um, so even though he had some social weaknesses, he had incredible social gifts as well. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, next question is, from what you've learned of Danny or Dan Markell in your research, what punishment do you think he would think would fit the crime? exactly the punishment that um, Katie McBannell would just receive, which is life in prison without the possibility of parole, uh, and the same punishment that Garcia received. And it's interesting that Garcia was actually uh, uh, tried uh, um, for the death penalty, that uh, the prosecution actually sought the death penalty against 
uh, him. Ironically, they're not seeking the death penalty against Charlie. Um, but um, Dan would not have approved of them seeking the death penalty against his own killer because Dan uh, believed the death penalty was horribly wrong. Uh, he, most retributivists, Dan was a retributivist, and most retributivists say the punishment's got to fit the crime. You kill somebody, you ought to be eligible for the death penalty. Dan thought the opposite. He thought the death penalty is meted out so incorrectly and so unfairly that it is not the punishment that fits the crime a lot of times. And he therefore argued for all people on death row throughout the world uh, to have their death sentences commuted um, and for them to serve life in prison instead of uh, being subjected to the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are Charlie Adelson's most culpable statements in the Dolce Vita FBI recording and why, in your opinion? Which is a great question. You know, that was the centerpiece of the prosecution's um, second, the second trial against Katie McDonough, where they made um, that 41 minute enhanced recording the centerpiece. And if I were to read to you all of the incriminating things Charlie said, we would go on for another hour or more. Um, chapter 27 of my book. Uh, which is a 15 page chapter goes into the details of all of the incriminating things that charlie said um, the title of that chapter appropriately enough comes straight out of, of the enhanced recording it's a little bit vulgar but it's if you want to arrest me fucking arrest me i'm going to read you just a couple of things which um, jumped off the page to me when i first read the transcript which was the day that Charlie was arrested. I was able to read the transcript of um, this recording. Um, but I'm gonna start with the, the very first paragraph of chapter 27. Thanks to Keith McElveen's technical wizardry. And Keith McElveen is the South Carolina audio forensic expert who basically broke this case wide open through the, the enhancement of the Dolce Vita recording. Thanks to his technical wizardry, many of the words spoken during Charlie's April 2016 conversation with Katie at Dolce Vita were finally audible for the first time in six years. What was captured by the enhanced audio that had Georgia Kappelman and Pat Sanford sprinting to the grand jury room to seek an indictment against Charles J. Adelson? Plenty. And I'm going to get to just a couple of things. What came out of his mouth next was even more illuminating, perhaps Charlie's most incriminating statement during their entire conversation. Let me ask you a question, he began. When everybody was there the next day, did any of you take any money? For anyone familiar with the Dan Markell murder investigation, Charlie's statement about everybody being there the next day with money seemed to be a stunningly clear reference to Tuto, Tato, and Katie congregating at Jessica Rodriguez's apartment the morning of July 19, 2014, for the money drop. Why would Charlie have asked Katie for more information about who was taking money when everybody was there the next day? Only one explanation made sense, because she was physically present at Rodriguez's apartment that morning and knew precisely what had transpired, whereas he wasn't. It's not like you're driving around in a Bentley, he added, cruising around in a mega yacht, you know? In other words, that Katie's possessions following the murder weren't lavish enough to be a dead giveaway that she'd suddenly come into a boatload of money. And then he said this, because otherwise he'd have no idea that I had anything to do with. Though Charlie didn't complete his thought, what he seemed to be saying was that his connection to the murder wouldn't be evident unless those who committed the crime on his behalf were all of a sudden dripping with wealth, just like him. So I'm going to stop there. Those are just a couple of snippets, but they're dynamite evidence against Charlie. And there's many, many more in the 41 minutes captured in the enhanced recording at Dolce Vita. Yeah. And that's why the prosecutors went straight to the grand jury room to say, we've got them. Because basically those 41 minutes were tantamount to a confession. Yes, I, I agree. Especially, I recall he said something like, why didn't they know it was me? Right. <laughs> why, right. why didn't they know it was me? <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, interesting. Yeah. Um, let me move on to the next question. Um, okay. 
Well, I, I know you did want to also talk about details of Charlie's arrest. Do you want to talk about that now or go through the question? I would be happy to. So okay. um, this has not been reported at all. Um, so I think your viewers are going to hear something that they probably don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. This is from cha a chapter in my book, chapter 27, called Big Fish. Um, and I'm sorry, chapter 26 called Big Fish. Uh, and this is the end of chapter 26. And it's after uh, Charlie has been indicted by the grand jury um, on April 20th. I'm sorry, April um, 21st. Tw April 20th, he's indicted by the grand jury. April 21st is the day of his arrest. Well aware that Charlie Adelson was a rabid gun enthusiast who had no reservation or compunction about taking human life, those responsible for the operation at his Fort Lauderdale home the next morning weren't about to take any chances. They assembled a well-trained, heavily armed battalion in full riot gear to take the newly indicted defendant into custody. Approximately 20 FBI agents and local police officers gathered a couple of blocks away just before 5 a.m. to receive their final instructions, the cover of darkness and element of surprise, offering a tactical advantage they hoped would prevent a shootout and bloody scene. Gradually, they surrounded the home from all sides, sealing off the perimeter. A couple of agents even stationed aboard a boat behind the property to, to prevent any attempted watery escape. Though movement was detected through Charlie's windows, agents couldn't determine whether the darkened figure was male or female. Officers positioned behind the rear fence were given the go-ahead to advance. But when they attempted to scale the fence, they were met with a most unwelcome surprise. It was lined at the top with razor wire, leading to some nasty cuts and the decision to retreat. Their initial plan foiled, the lead agent dialed Charlie on his cell phone to try to coax him to surrender peacefully, but no one answered. Floodlights were then directed against the front of the home, brightly illuminating the entire property and shining into the residence through the windows. An agent grabbed a bullhorn, demanding that Charlie come out with his hands held high. Several officers crouched in defensive positions throughout the front yard, their weapons aimed at the front door, the tension and anticipation reaching a crescendo. Yet nothing happened. Storming the home with massive force was beginning to look like their only viable option, despite its attendant risks. The lead agent tried calling Charlie one final time before resorting to that approach. Lo and behold, this time he answered and walked out the front door precisely as instructed. Rather than a man itching for a confrontation or a bloody shootout, what officers, um, what officers observed emerging into the ultra bright lights was a most amusing sight. Not only was Charlie unarmed, he was nearly naked a pair of skimpy boxer shorts, the only fabric covering his large frame. Shielding his eyes from the glaring light with his forearm, bewildered and confused, he asked, am I under arrest? Officers quickly swarmed him, cuffing his hands behind his back and reading him his rights. They led him back inside to find some clothing and get him dressed. What the arresting officers spotted through their peripheral vision as they walked their prize through his living space reveal just how lucky they were to nab him without a full-scale battle. Rifles and guns were displayed everywhere, mostly near windows and doors, one even resting on a tripod pointed out a window. The entire operation easily could have devolved into a very different and deadly scene. Charlie appeared dazed and disoriented as the officers led him through the house, incoherent gibberish, his only audible sounds likely because he was under the influence of marijuana or some other narcotic. Finally, fully clothed and ready for prime time, the handcuffed arrestee was marched back outside, flanked by officers who'd likely remember this particular perp walk for years. As they approached a squad car and placed Charlie in the back seat, one of the agents standing nearby was soaking in the spectacle with particularly intense interest. Pat Sanford had waited nearly eight years for this very occasion, 
gladly making the seven hour drive from Tally with the freshly issued indictment in hand to witness Charlie's arrest with his own two eyes. His hard work and that of dozens of federal agents and TPD investigators had finally paid off. For him, the moment was akin to winning the Super Bowl and the World Series all at once. Within minutes, the police car containing the perceived mastermind behind Dan Markell's vicious slaying was on its way to the Broward County Jail, the same facility where Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Katie Magbanoa had all passed through during each one's years-long march to justice. By 9 a.m., news of Charlie Adelson's arrest was reverberating all across the internet, as was the mugshot snapped while he was being proce processed at the jail. In the photo, his curly brown hair was so long and disheveled, flying wildly in every direction, it wasn't even fully captured in the square frame. His green eyes were bloodshot and glassy, face devoid of expression, beard unkempt, and lips pressed tightly together. Hardly the image the 45-year-old millionaire bachelor or his proud parents or kid sister would have selected to be featured in the Miami Herald or on the TV news later that day. Fully 2,834 days since the brutal, cold-blooded execution of his ex-brother-in-law, the maestro was finally behind bars. His life as a Ferrari-driving, steroid-ingesting, playboy periodontist seemingly gone for good. That was Charlie's arrest. Interesting, yes. So you obviously had to continue writing and adding more stuff after <laughs> the first draft of the story, huh? Interesting. And um, yeah, I emailed you that last minute question today where someone wanted to know what do you think would be Charlie's defenses? The evidence against him is overwhelming, overwhelming. I would not want to be Daniel Rashbaum uh, trying to figure out what to do with all of this. Um, it's, it's just overwhelming. And that's if Katie and Garcia don't turn and there's still every likelihood one or both of them will. But even if they don't, the overwhelming evidence is that he was the mastermind behind this hit. And he basically bragged to Katie during Dolce Vita about what he'd done. Um, and during many of the wiretap calls, he talked about going to get the reward money several times, talked about going to the FBI and the cops, of course, never did any of those things. And there's only one reason a jury is going to find he never did those things. And that's because what he's accused of doing, he did. Well, isn't that interesting that I hear police sirens blaring? That's, that's that out in downtown Raleigh. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Just as you're talking about it, we hear the police sirens because that's not coming from my place. So, um, OK, well, somebody is asking a real quick question. Like, were you actually there? How do you know all the details about Charlie's arrest? Done a ton of interviews and I have all kinds of confidential sources that will not be revealed. OK, thank you. OK, so let's go on to the next question. During Charlie's trial, assuming there will be one, will the prosecution be able to let the jurors know that Garcia, Rivera, and Magbenua have already been convicted? Uh, there, there's pretty much no way that that's not going to come out. I mean, for one, uh, Rivera will be a witness, right? Um, and that's part of the questioning of Rivera is that he has been convicted, and that certainly the de defense is going to bring that out. So, um, and again, it's quite possible that either Katie or Garcia could be witnesses. So the, the chances that the jury won't know that all three of them um, have been convicted is very, very small. Mm -hmm. I see. And do you think Dr. Jerry Obed, Donna Adelson, Harvey Adelson, or Robert Adelson will be called to testify? So as far as Adelson, I mean, the, the, this, this, um, um, this was actually broached um, in the last case, whether the Adelsons, other than Wendy, could be called to testify uh, and subpoenaed. And the answer is no, they can't and they won't. And they don't have any useful information uh, to offer about you know, these facts. They're certainly not going to incriminate themselves. And so Harvey's not going to come incriminate himself. Donna's not going to come incriminate herself. They would take the Fifth Amendment 
And Judge Wheeler already ruled in the last trial, we're not going to have a spectacle of people coming just to invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege. So they're not going to come testify. Rob Adelson doesn't have any information, direct information about these events. So he's not going to be called to testify. Um, and Jerome Obed, you know, he, he knows what Charlie was doing um, in, you know, the years that he was living with him as his roommate. But um, in terms of what's useful for either the prosecution or the defense, he doesn't really have any useful um, testimony either. Remember, a witness can't just speculate or give opinions about what they think might have happened. Uh, they have to have seen with their own two eyes or heard with their own two ears something that is relevant to whether something did happen or didn't happen. And these are people who are either not going to take the witness stand because of the Fifth Amendment protection that they have or because they simply don't know information that would be relevant. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes. And similarly, you know, for example, if Charlie were dealing drugs or selling steroids and stuff, I mean, that likely wouldn't come in, right? No, because it's, it's not, not relevant, relevant. To, the, to, the, to his, he's not, he's not charged with those offenses. He's charged with murder. So only things that relate to his likely guilt or innocence of the charges of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation of murder, only those things um, could come in. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, let's see. And let's move on to some book related questions. Um, someone wanted to know why is your book being published now as opposed to later since the case is still going on? Because I've been working on this for nearly two years and I'm ready to move on with my life is, is really the answer to that question. And it was just a true miracle, a gift from God that I got to close this book with the events of April and May of 2022. I was about ready to call it a wrap before this trial because it kept on getting continued. Um, and, you know, I had a sixth sense, maybe I should just wait. Maybe something good is gonna happen. Uh, it's almost as if I had slipped uh, Georgia Kappelman and, and Jack Campbell, the, the state attorney, a few hundred dollars to go arrest Charlie so that I can end my book on a better note. You know, what I just read would not have been in my book had I ended it earlier. Um, and certainly Katie McBenowitz's trial, a second trial and her conviction. I mean, that that was a really nice way, I think, to end this story. And yes, there's obviously more that's going to happen. Uh, and people have asked, am I going to write another book or am I going to add to this book? Um, I've told the story of this relationship between Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson how it spiraled out of control, who this entire cast of characters is, and what motivates them. That's the story. Um, the trial that happens next, if there is another trial, um, is really not the major part of this story. The major part of this story is who are these people and what made them do what they did. And that story is told in my book, Extreme Punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, can you... This is kind of going backwards in time, but what inspired you to write the book in the first place? It's not what, it's who. So the protagonist in my second book, who is the mother of Mike Williams, um, Cheryl Williams, uh, we speak fairly regularly. Um, I've be become a good friend of hers and she's a good friend of mine. And she was constantly needling me about, what are you writing next? Because I had finished that book and moved on. What are you writing next? And at one point she said, you ought to write about Dan Markell. And I knew next to nothing about the Dan Markell case at that point. But Cheryl Williams is somebody who's important in my life. And she said, I ought to look at it. So I did. And amazingly, um, on my DVR, I have um, satellite TV. I have um, uh, direct TV. And somehow, mysteriously, the Dateline episode on uh, this case called Tallahassee Trap, a two-hour special, just appeared on my DVR as a recorded program. I didn't tell it to do that. And it did. And I watched that two hour dateline and was so enraptured with this story that I was like, I think I will, I think I will write this. And then I listened to the Over My Dead Body podcast. Um, and then I was absolutely hooked and knew I was gonna write it. Coming full circle, I'm now appearing on the next dateline episode, which is currently in production. Uh, I filmed a few weeks ago uh, in New York and I'll be on that Dateline episode. And uh, Matt Scher, who did the Over My Dead Body podcast as a narrator and creator, he's going to have a review quote on the front cover of my book. Uh, so it's just amazing how life comes full circle. And beyond that, Dan uh, Dan Markell is a character who I share a lot of similarities with. And, and unfortunately, I don't share the similarity of the wide and deep social network that he had, which was amazing. But I was a law professor. 
Uh, I was a law clerk to a federal judge like him. I was, you know, trying to climb the academic ladder as he was. I was never as successful as he was. Um, I did grow up Jewish and understand all of the Jewish things that were part of his background and also part of this story about his struggles with Wendy and his in-laws. Uh, so there's a lot in this story that resonates with me. And, you know, when I tell a story, typically it's because something resonates with me and there's a lot in this story that does. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, I think you kind of touched on this, but would you consider writing an update or a sequel to the book? I will never say never, but my next book is going to be a work of fiction. I have spent so many years chasing down minutia and facts and interviewing people so that I can tell stories like the story of Charlie's arrest. And that is so painstaking and time consuming. Uh, I've decided my next book is going to be a novel. It's going to be a crime fiction, uh, but it's one where I get to make the facts up so I don't have to I sweat over every tiny little fact to make sure that I've gotten it right because every fact is one I've made up. So that's what I'm doing next. Okay. Okay. And uh, getting back to trying to track down different people and track down information to get all the facts right. Um, did you try to reach out to Rivera or Garcia to get their insights? No, there are several reasons why I do not, and this has been true for all of my books, why I do not try, I, I don't want to interfere in an ongoing case in any way, shape or form. And the last thing I want to happen is Rivera to be on the witness stand saying, yeah, this guy called me and he was, he's writing a book and he was like, I, 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 I don't want to do that because I don't want to interfere uh, with the lawyers doing their jobs uh, at all. And so, and, and it also, I don't have that purient interest either. I don't want to get into the mind of Garcia or Rivera. That's, that's not what I'm trying to do at all. Uh, so no, I didn't try to interview them and I haven't ever tried to enter my first book. I didn't ever try to interview Jason Young, who's, uh, was convicted of murdering his wife. Uh, I never tried to interview, um, Brian Winchester or Denise Williams who were convicted, uh, in the case against Mike Williams. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, okay, and on that note, in regards to working on the book, were you ever threatened or, quote, encouraged to not pursue something? Or did you find people who would not cooperate with your investigation for the book? It's funny you should mention the threatened part. My wife was trying to talk me out of writing this book. She said, they hired hitmen to kill somebody and you want to now get out there and be killed by hitmen? Uh, but no, nobody has threatened me. Um, none of that. Um, uh, there were people who wouldn't talk to me, but that's normal. There are people who are too close to the story, including very good friends of Dan's, who it just was too emotional. Um, Amy Adler, who was Dan Markell's very serious girlfriend at the time of his death, just too emotional to just you know pick at those scabs and wounds. So it makes perfect sense that people like that wouldn't talk to me. Uh, Wendy's, some of Wendy's friends wouldn't talk to me, um, and it makes perfect sense that they wouldn't. Uh, law enforcement officers where I was trying to get some background information, although I did speak to some, there were others who wouldn't speak to me. So, you know, that's that's common in this business of not being able to have everybody talk to you. That's that's normal. Mm -hmm. Yes. But was anyone outwardly hostile towards you? Um, there is one person who was outwardly hostile toward me. So I'm going to I guess I'll get to that now. Her name is Wendy Adelson. Um, uh, I did interview several of Wendy's uh, friends, um, including uh, people who remained her friends after the murder. Um, but I did reach out to a couple. And I think one of your um, viewers asked if I tried to interview uh, Jane McPherson, who was with Wendy uh, during her, the latter part of her interview at the Tallahassee Police Department the day of the murder. Um, I reached out to her. I also reached out to Daniel Sack, who was the other Daniel, who she was dating immediately after Dan Markell. Um, and that was the guy that Jeff Lacoste was so jealous of and thought she was still having a relationship with behind his back. I reached out to both of them. I've got the emails in front of me on March 20th, 2021, which was about three, four months into my process of working on this book. And I reached out to both of them with these few words, the, the, starting with these few words, my apology for this intrusion. OK, so I sent that email on March 20th, 2021, asking them if they would agree to to speak with me. And I started my apology for this intrusion. Monday, March 22nd, 2021, two days later at 1053 in the morning, I'm sitting at my computer, the same one I'm sitting at right now. And I look in my inbox and there's an email from somebody named Wendy Adelson. This is two days after I reached out to Daniel Sack 
and Jane McPherson, both of whom had been good friends of Wendy's. She start, she, the subject line of her email to me, I had never tried to reach out to Wendy, the subject line, central character. She says, dear Steve, my apology for the intrusion, my exact words to her friends, but my friends have contacted me about your interview requests. As a central character in your writing, I am curious why you haven't contacted me. Most sincerely, Wendy. That was my first interaction with Wendy Adelson. Mm -hmm. And I've been at this business long enough to know this woman's messing with me. This isn't a woman who is truly trying to have me interview her. She's messing with me. She is basically trying to stick her fingers in my eyes because she doesn't like the fact that I'm reaching out to her friends and she doesn't like the fact that I'm writing this book. So I called her bluff and I responded and told her I wasn't interested in asking any questions about the murder, the events of July 2014. I was much more interested in things like her childhood, growing up and her relationship with her siblings, her appearance on The Weakest Link and what that was like, her college years. Um, and so I gave her this list of things that I would have would love to talk with her about. And I told her the only reason I haven't reached out to you is I assumed that she would not be willing to talk to me. Did she respond? She didn't respond. And I knew she wasn't going to respond. So in October, on October 8th, which is six plus months later, I decided, what the heck? I'm going to reach out to her to make sure she'd actually gotten my email. And I wrote her on October 8th, Dear Wendy, as you know, I responded to your email shortly after you sent it. Since I haven't heard back from you, it's been my assumption that you are not interested in speaking with me. Please let me know if that's not the case, as I'd appreciate the opportunity to interview you. Thanks so much. So that was at 1.13 p.m. 27 minutes later, I got a response <laughs> from Wendy. Steve, you do not have my consent to use my identity and trauma for your own profit. Best, Wendy. And that ended my two interactions with Wendy Adelson. We have not had further interactions since okay. then. Okay. Well, did her attorney also reach out to you? No. No, and, and Wendy, as an attorney, knew full well when she was telling me that I didn't I didn't have her consent to use her identity and trauma for my own profit. She knew full well, I don't need her consent, nor does the Tallahassee Democrat or USA Today or Miami Herald or Dateline or Over My Dead Body podcast by Wondery. Nobody needs her consent to tell this story. Mm -hmm. Well, what about what about her friends? Because I think one of the subscribers specifically asked, did you try to talk to Tova Walsh or um, did Jane McPherson respond to you? Jane McPherson didn't respond. Wendy responded instead because uh, clearly Jane McPherson forwarded my email to Wendy. Uh, so I did not get to talk to Jane McPherson as much I as I would have liked to. Uh, Tova Walsh, I reached out to. Um, she appeared um, in um, the 2020 um, on behalf the, the Adelson family searched for friends of Wendy's who would agree to go on camera. Mm -hmm. Tova Walsh was the one who agreed to go on camera as the friend of Wendy. Others declined. And I will tell you that I, I had communications with folks who declined to go on camera and are not going to be mentioned by name in my book and will not be acknowledged in my book. But yes, I did speak with people who were friends of Wendy. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. What about Jeffrey Lacoste? Did you speak with him? Reached out to him and he said, no, he would not speak with me. And that was that. Um, that said, he has spoken with others who are doing projects on this case. There's an HBO Max project that's in the works. Um, and I know for a fact he has had numerous uh, conversations with people who are working on that project. So for whatever reason, he decided I would not be somebody that he would talk to. Mm -hmm. Were you able to watch his full interrogation? Yes, and I have transcripts of all of these as well. So I've studied very closely um, all of the words that were spoken by all the people who were interviewed by law enforcement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And lots of people whose names that you don't even think of, but some of that's in the book. So there's interesting stuff that came from some other people that you know didn't make the cut for trial purposes, but had very interesting things to say about Wendy and Dan's divorce. Um, about Dan's life as he moved on after the divorce and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Including a lot of law professor friends. Um, there, Dan had so many friends and 
a lot of the really, really good information I got about Dan and Wendy's divorce and things that were just eating away at him, um, I got from his law professor friends, who I'm really indebted to. Oh, well, that that's great. I'm sure you were really relieved when at least some people would respond to you, right? Oh, yeah. I had I had over 50 people that I spoke with in, in the course of writing this book. Mm -hmm. And are you able to say whether you were able to talk to Dan's immediate family or yes. relatives? Yes. And I was also sitting behind them. If you actually look at some of the photos taken during the second trial, I was seated directly behind them for the entire second week of the trial. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And, and, and in a way, much like Cheryl Williams has become a friend of mine and somebody that I feel very strongly about, I would say the same about Ruth Martell. Um, she's a, a wonderful, strong lady. Um, her book is coming out too, called The Unveiling. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead and pre-order that. That one's available for pre-order. Mine isn't. Um, but I think the world of Ruth Martell. And um, one of the things that I'm going to be sad about when I leave the world of true crime and start writing fiction is that I won't be able to share this journey with people like Ruth Markell and, and uh, Cheryl Williams, um, who I have formed close bonds with in the course of writing about um, their sons. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. Yeah, and we'll just um, just go ahead, since you mentioned it, people can go ahead and pre-order Ruth Markell's book on Amazon.com, and it will be out towards the end of September. So. September 20th. Yes, that's my book is going to be out October 9th and it'll be available for pre order probably late September. Okay, great, great. Okay, let's go back to this huge list of questions. Um, okay, what about uh, were you able to interview any friends or relatives of Garcia, Rivera, or Meg Benua? Um, no, um, again, that was not the main angle of this story. The main angle of this story is the relationship between Dan and Wendy and how it spiraled out of control. So I, there is a chapter uh, called uh, Tato and Tuto that gets into the background of the two of them and Katie Magdanawa as well. Uh, it's not a terribly long chapter, but I did not want to go into all kinds of details about them because they're not really what this story is about. They were the people who did the dirty deed of the rich, wealthy white people, of the, you know, the wealthy white people who wanted the deed done. But this really isn't a story about them. It's a story about those wealthy white people who wanted this done and about the relationship at the center of the story between Dan and Wendy. Mm -hmm. I see. OK. And were you able to speak with any of the attorneys involved? So I, I, I'm somewhat remiss in saying it's a story just about Dan and Wendy and then the people around them, because it's also a lawyer story. And I can't write a book like this without telling a story of lawyers. And so, yes, I spoke with all of the lawyers, um, all of the prosecutors, all of the defense lawyers, um, and actually had numerous communications with them during the second trial because, uh, you know, there were breaks. And so I would you know, shoot the bull with them, actually met uh, Charlie Adelson's attorney, uh, Rashbaum as well, and had nice conversations with him. Very nice guy, very good attorney. I think he's going to do the best he can for his client. Uh, but I, you know, yes. So there's a lot of biograph biographical information about these attorneys. They have incredible life stories, all of them. Uh, I was fascinated and I wasn't planning on including as much biography about these lawyers as I wound up doing. But there's a chapter called Lawyering Up where I dive into the biographies of Tara Kawas and Krista Coase and Sam Zangane uh, and Georgia Kappelman, whose father played in the NFL. Um, was a, you know, a, a huge successful quarterback for Florida State and then played in the NFL and then moved back to Tallahassee, which is where Georgia was born and raised. So yeah, there's a lot of information about the lawyers. Also the, the domestic attorneys, the family law attorneys um, gave me a lot of time and that's how I was able to tell the story about Dan's divorce. There was a lot of in the divorce files, but there's also a lot of information that I picked up on from the divorce lawyers for Dan Markell, Thomas Duggar and um, Scott Snavely. So, yes, I had extensive conversations with lawyers, and there's a lot of lawyering uh, in this book. And I love writing the lawyering part of these stories because that's that's my background. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. OK. And how much time did you spend in Tallahassee doing research for the book and attending court hearings? Um, so not only did I spend time in Tallahassee, um, I also want to say that I went to Toronto, um, which is where Dan Markell uh, spent most of his years growing up. He was born in Montreal, moved to Toronto when he was five. Uh, that's where I physically met Ruth Markell for the first time, though I'd spoken with her many times before then. Um, and so that was nice to physically meet Ruth Markell. 
Uh, and I also went to Danny's grave site, um, which I've done for all three of my books. I don't know why, but I feel like I must do that in order to tell a story about someone's brutal murder. I need to actually be there where they're in the ground to this day. Uh, and that was a moving experience for me to be uh, at his grave site. Um, and then I was in Tallahassee. Uh, ironically, I was in Tallahassee for the 20th anniversary of the disappearance and murder of Mike Williams, who was the person who was killed in my second book. Um, and while I was there in Tallahassee, I did double duty. And that's when I met Jim Geiger, uh, the next door neighbor to Dan Markell. And, and I literally had him, had him walk me through the paces of what he went through on that harrowing uh, morning when Dan Markell was shot in his driveway. Um, and I met with the juror who I just described, you know, what was going through her mind. I met with her while I was there. I met with Dan's friends, um, some of Dan's friends while I was there. So that was that initial trip to Tallahassee. And then my second trip to Tallahassee for this case was for the second trial uh, when I was there for a full week uh, during um, the second week of the trial. Unfortunately, uh, the jury deliberations lasted so long, I had a bolt and, and head to the airport. I actually found out about the jury's verdict while I was in the restroom in the Atlanta airport for my connecting flight uh, when I learned that, in fact, uh, Dan had been, I'm sorry, that Tatum McDonough had been convicted of first degree murder. Mm -hmm. I watched I it on my phone on, on their live stream in the courtroom. Ah, oh, okay. Interesting. And how did you feel when you heard the sentence or heard that she was found guilty? Well, I was relieved that it wasn't going to be another hung jury, first off. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt pretty convinced having, you know, the, the prosecution's case was tighter. They only had one defendant to go after this time. They had the Dolce Vita evidence and the defense theory uh, about this so-called conspiracy between Garcia and um, and Katie fell very flat. It looked like they were going to try and call Garcia to try and make that stick. And when he didn't come testify, you know, there was nobody who provided any testimony supporting that theory. So I felt pretty certain that the jury was going to come back with a conviction. Um, and they did. I was, I was glad that there was no holdout juror this time around who decided for reasons other than Katie's guilt or innocence that they weren't going to convict. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, um, can you give us any general impressions of the attorneys or witnesses you saw while you were sitting there in court for the trial? Well, I will say that the, the one thing that really struck me while I was there absorbing sort of the ambiance of courtroom 3G um, was the, the different tenor that was coming out of the defense table in this trial than the first trial. And when I say the defense table, I mean Tara Kwas and Krista Coase defending Katie McDonough. I mean, they were so, so passionate in the first trial. Um, this was a wrongly accused um, defendant. She shouldn't be there. She should be allowed to go home. It was going to be a wrongful conviction. And, you know, they they harped on that so incessantly. And to to a large extent, Tora Kawas did in the second trial as well. But Krista Coast seemed to be completely different in the second trial. He was given a smaller role. He didn't do the closing argument, for instance. Um, he didn't do some of the cross examinations that he did in the first trial. Um, so uh, Tara Kawas had a larger role. He had a smaller role. And I just got a sense that his heart wasn't quite in it the same way as it was the first go around. And then over at the prosecution table, um, Sarah Catherine Dugan, and she's a double name. So people call her Sarah Dugan, but it's actually Sarah Catherine Dugan. Um, was a really great ad for Georgia Kappelman, this go around. Anna Norris had left the, the uh, state attorney's office, so she needed to replace her. Sarah Catherine Dugan was absolutely dynamite during the cross-examination of uh, Katie McDonough. As I said in the book, it was a masterful, masterful cross-examination. Um, and it was so incredibly effective how they used the Dolce Vita um, audio during Magdana was cross-examination to make the jurors listen to those segments over and over and over again and basically have Katie sit there speechless as to, you know, she had heard those words, but, you know, she still sat there and kept listening and talking with Charlie. And yet she supposedly knew nothing at all about the murder of Dan Markell at the time she was listening to those words, which made no sense. So uh, I think the prosecution did a fantastic job. Um, I think, um, the, the defense was weakened by Charlie Adelson's arrest uh, and their inability to, you know, get on the, the, the soapbox and say, this is all about trying to get to Charlie Adelson so they can arrest him. 
that was that, that rug was pulled out from under them when they arrested Charlie Adelson. It really made a difference in the in the second trial. The, the defense was not nearly as effective as they were in the first trial. Not to take anything away from Chris Coast, I, I think he's a fantastic courtroom lawyer. Really, really good. And as you'll learn in in uh, reading the book about his biography, uh, that started in law school when he was a law student at Suffolk Law. He was a trial team superstar when he was in law school, and that's what led him to becoming initially a prosecutor and then later a defense attorney. He loves the courtroom, and he's really, really good at what he does. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, um, I think we went through that whole list of questions that people had submitted prior to today's show. So um, is there anything else you'd like to expound upon before we take some random questions? No, I'd love to hear more questions. I'm sure people, especially those who are pissed off that I'm not, you know, putting Wendy Adelson on a sizzling hot platter and frying her up like everybody else wants to do. I'm sure there are going to be some questions about that. So I'll be delighted to answer whatever questions uh, your viewers have. Okay. Well, I mean, of course, somebody or people have mentioned that even the state has named Wendy as a co-conspirator. With not, the... not actually, no, that's not quite true. They named her as a co-conspirator in dealing with a defense motion to try and bring all of the Adelsons um, against their will under subpoenas to testify. So the state has not pursued any charges against Wendy Adelson. Her being named as a co-conspirator has nothing to do with. Um, their potential pursuit of her as a criminal defendant. It had to do with how to deal with a defense attempt to subpoena and bring into the courtroom for basically show all of the Adelsons and have them take the fifth in front of the jury, which Judge Wheeler said he wasn't going to allow to happen. That was the only reference to her being a co-conspirator was as part of that back and forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's take some questions now then. Is okay. that all right? Okay. Sure. Okay. So is your book going to be available digital, digitally? On it's going to be on Kindle. It's going to be a paperback book. Um, and it's also going to be on Audible. The Audible version will lag because, the, the, you know, somebody's got it out. Uh, I did the narration of the second book, Evil at Lake Seminole. I'm not doing the narration of this book. We haven't even picked a narrator yet. Okay. Okay. Here's somebody else from Long Island. Um, that does Oceanside, your family... Oceanside High School graduate, 1983. That's me. Wow. Does your family still live around there? Uh, yes, I have family members that are still living in New York. When I went to do my Dateline interview, I actually uh, had dinner with my mother while I was there. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Is she very proud of you now becoming oh, a well-known author? Ridiculously. And I think she might even be, if my mother's out there, she might even be on this live stream. Hi, mom. Oh, hey, mom. Hey, he's <laughs> famous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'm scrolling through. There are so many comments and I really appreciate so many people tuning in. And um, I do too. This is fun. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Miss Pepper says, per Jeffrey Lacoste, Wendy started using a different phone as she thought police had bugged hers. Um, do, do you recall hearing that? I don't. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have a crush on Wendy? <laughs> not hardly. Not hardly. Okay. No, she, she's not in my list of top 20, 200, or 2,000 favorite people. And I knew the second that she reached out to me, she was messing with me. Um, and, you know, her testimony from the witness stand at both trials left a lot to be desired. Um, and what she's done to the Markell family uh, since this murder has just been horrific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let me try to find some questions here. Okay. So Lady Cymbeline has really been following this case. She says, I believe there's a strong possibility Wendy was dropping off the sons on Thursday morning and was spotted by Rivera and Garcia. In the first trial, she talked about Wednesday night sleepovers on alternate weeks. Actually, Wendy saw the, the boys um, at Whole Foods having dinner with Dan that, that night, that same Wednesday night. Um, because Wednesdays, they did a crossover overnight. Um, they had week on week off with a crossover overnight on Wednesday. And the boys um, um, were with Dan, in fact, uh, and she was getting them later um, and then bringing them to preschool. Uh, so no, none of, none of that's true. Um, she, she, mm -hmm. she was not on Trescott Drive at all that day. And of course, um, they, did, did, they did scrubs of all the cell, cell tower dumps. And if her phone was pinging anywhere near there, that they would have that. And that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, and um, we haven't talked much about Donna Adelson. So, what's your opinion about Donna Adelson? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, the, the, there's overwhelming evidence of her guilt. Obviously, she's not on as many wiretaps uh, incriminating herself uh, like Charlie did, and she's not at Dolce Vita sitting at the table with Katie and um, her son. Uh, but her comment, you know, as to when Charlie asked, "Who does this involve?" and she said, "The two of us." You probably know what I'm talking about. That's dynamite. Um, that is absolutely dynamite. And then her stroking um, two checks a month for 17 months. It's actually 44 checks that she, she stroked as a payoff to Katie Magdanawa to make sure she kept her lips sealed tight, which she's done to this day. Um, that's that's horrifically incriminating evidence against Donna. Um, you know, one of the sort of funny but not so funny things that uh, Charlie said in the Dolce Vita recording was how upset he was that his mom his mom was up all night having diarrhea, and you know that that wasn't okay. And if anybody was going after his family, there was going to be some Nazi shit. No price too high, you know that they it was such a uh, codependent family, such an enmeshed family, um, and you know they're they're all in, insanely protective of one another, um, and it's just so easy to see how Donna and Char Donna wanted these kids. Charlie wanted to make Donna's wish come true. Charlie hated Dan Markell and hated what Dan Markell was putting Wendy through. And it's to me, it's very easy to see how one plus one equals two. They they conspired to eliminate Dan behind Wendy's back because Wendy wouldn't do anything that they that Donna especially was trying to get Wendy to do to achieve the relocation. And then she had to agree to a divorce agreement uh, to a marital uh, settlement agreement that uh, had the kids remaining in Tallahassee. And that wasn't, that was okay with Wendy at the time, but it wasn't okay with Donna Adelson and Charlie being the rabid gun enthusiast that he is and never afraid to do all kinds of things, legal or not. It's clear to me, he said, we'll take care of this problem. And Donna was in on it with him. And that's, that is in my view, how they knew Dan's schedule because Donna would have known Dan's schedule. Donna was spending as much time in Tallahassee uh, during the divorce proceedings as she was spending in South Florida. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And how about this? So um, like, what do you know about them using WhatsApp to communicate? Um, well, Charlie and Katie did use that on occasion. What's really odd is why they only use that on occasion because, you know, all the incriminating stuff that they got on the wiretaps, like if they're being secretive and using WhatsApp, why are they also blabbing on phones, you know, if the, one of the first words that Charlie said at Dolce Vita that's, that was audible was, you know, if they were bugging your phone, you know, he was clearly aware there was a possibility the phones might be bugged, but it didn't stop them from talking on the phones. Um, Wendy Adelson, you know, if you look at her phone record, she's talking on the phone to her mother and her brother constantly. But that was true for years and years and years because they are a thoroughly enmeshed family. Mm -hmm. um, so whether they'll ever find WhatsApp messages, I mean, basically the testimony has been they're not recoverable. That's law enforcement's testimony is WhatsApp messages that went back and forth. They would not be able to recover those messages. And there were clearly some. Mm -hmm. I see. OK, um, let me scroll through. I'm sure there's plenty more questions here to address. Oh, OK. Why did Wendy hang up, according to the police, on the police when they called her after the family fled Tallahassee without meeting the police as agreed? Her lawyer called the police right after. It's because the same reason that Harvey and Donna Adelson, when Craig Isom approached them at the memorial service for Dan that Sunday, why they said, sure, we'll talk with you. And they weren't ever going to talk with Craig Isom. But once they had Wendy in the fold, they weren't going to allow Wendy to have any further communications. Wendy did all of that. Remember, she was picked up at a restaurant where she was having lunch with her friends and brought to the Tallahassee Police Department without ever having any opportunity to speak with her parents. She didn't speak with her parents until very late in that five hour interview. So they didn't have an opportunity to basically corral her and make sure she was on their team. Once they did, and by that Sunday afternoon of the memorial service, they had already made sure that Wendy was on their team uh, there was no way that Wendy was going to talk further with the police. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why they lawyered up. They lawyered up for Wendy and got jo John Laura was involved by that Monday. The Monday after the murder, John Laura was involved, the same attorney who's representing her today. 
they lawyered up the whole family once they saw what was going down and they lawyered up wendy and weren't going to let wendy have further discussions with the police this is all about remember jeff lacoste one of the things that he said that i agree with uh, wholeheartedly is that they in info infantilized uh, wendy i can't even say that word but they basically treated her as an infant every time wendy would need to come to tallahassee they would drive seven hours to tallahassee and then they would drive back to miami with her because she even as a 20 something 30 something year old woman she wasn't mature enough to do that on her own in their view um mm -hmm. so you know once they said wendy this is gonna, this is how it's going to be we're going to all get lawyers and we're not talking further with the police as much as craig isom wanted to talk further with all of them they all said no Mm -hmm. I see. Yes. Um, yeah. Getting back to the framing of Jeffrey Lacoste, which many people believe, you know, is what happened and that Wendy deliberately set him up like that. Um, Fancy Fiction, who does a ton of videos with those wiretaps, um, she says Lu Lewis said they were supposed to do the killing the first night they were in town in June. That was the same night that Wendy sent Jeff driving towards Danny's house to get stomach medicine. Right. Do you recall that? Oh, no, no. Jeff wasn't driving toward Danny's house. He was, you know, where Wendy, he, he just went to the to a store to get Pepto-Bismol for it. So that's not actually accurate. No, that he didn't. Uh, Jeff Lacoste did not go anywhere near uh, Trescott Drive uh, on June 4th, 2014. Uh, the, the point Jeff Lacoste was trying to make is Wendy was so upset that night. He's mm -hmm. suggesting she knew that there was going to be a murder that day. That, that's the point that Jeff is trying to make and saying something was up with Wendy. She had a lot of anxiety and she wouldn't tell me why. Not that Jeff was actually physically near what turned out to be the, the murder scene the following month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And he did say something about how she would always have like stomach problems, you know, whenever she was really nervous or stressed. She had a lot of issues and she was seeing because of the nasty divorce, she was seeing both the psychiatrist and a therapist. And Dan actually was telling people she was nuts um, and she was furious with him. That's that's when they're when Dan was still trying to woo her back. That was the thing that made her go completely in the opposite direction is that Dan was telling people that she was she was crazy. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, I mean, what's your opinion about um, Dan's behavior during the divorce? Because I, I guess you've already read all the divorce file, which oh, yeah. I haven't read. But um, like, I'm going to send think, you it so you can read it to some thank of you. Your, your, thank you. Read your viewers. Yeah. So, but in general, like, what was your opinion of Dan? You know, based on the divorce pleadings. Well, I start a chapter by by using Abraham Lincoln's old adage that anyone who um, um, has, a voice, who yeah, has a fool for a client, anybody who represents himself as a fool for a client, Dan didn't technically represent himself, but he was way too involved. He wrote all of the motions and pleadings. Um, his lawyers basically signed his work. You know, they reviewed it. They made corrections. But this, this was Dan's case and he was too involved. And he had lots of friends telling him, Dan, your life is good. I mean, you've got a new girlfriend, Amy Adler. Things are going well. You need to stop obsessing over all this stuff. He was obsessed about the kids not Skyping with him. He was obsessed of, you know, Wendy not letting that happen. He was obsessed about Donna's involvement. The fact that he wasn't, he had a right of first refusal and the kids, instead of coming to him, they were with Wendy's parents when Wendy would go out at night and go to parties. Um, and he, he was furious about a lot of things. And as I say in the book, the interesting thing that I learned he was most upset because he thought they could parent together more effectively. Uh, and he wanted Wendy and he to basically have lots more communication. He wanted her to have access to the boys during his custodial time. And he wanted to have access to the boys during her custodial time. He wanted to blur the lines between the two of them and not have a traditional divorce with his time and her time. And he didn't seem to understand that that was the last thing in the world that Wendy wanted. So it was unfortunately spiraling out of control the whole time. And Dan said a lot of things in these pleadings that were harsh and biting. And not only did Wendy react negatively to them, clearly Donna, Harvey, and Charlie did as well. And he, he didn't seem to understand that he was really, really, really pissing them off. Um, but his heart was in the right place. He wanted those boys to grow up with as normal a life as they could, even though his parents were now divorced. 
and he wanted desperately to co-parent effectively with Wendy and she didn't want any part of it. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And um, Esther asks if Wendy had nothing to do with it, why, why does that she not turn on the family like older brother Robert? Um, yeah. And my understanding is that you did speak a little with, with Robert. I did not speak with Robert. No, I did oh. not. Um, okay. He was interviewed extensively on the Over My Dead Body podcast that Matt Sherrod did. So I certainly had access to that information. Uh, Robert was not enmeshed with his family and Robert was the black sheep of the family because he dared to date a woman who was um, Indian American and then eventually married her. Um, and the family was livid with him because she she wasn't Jewish. And yet Dan was too Jewish, as it turned out. <laughs> um, Wendy is very enmeshed with her family, has always been uh, with her mom, her dad and her brother. And so she's not going to turn on them. Whatever she may know about what they did, didn't do, she's not going to turn on them. And uh, it's pretty unlikely Charlie's going to turn on anybody for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, because I kind of got the impression that she also sort of cut off the older brother too, even though they had a really close relationship when they were kids. Well, and Rob has gone out of his way to say he thinks his family's involved. And, you know, so you basically sort of have like you have to pick your sides in a divorce. You know, if you were friends with both the, the husband and the wife, you got to pick your sides once they split. It's sort of the same thing here. And once Rob went out of his way to, to tell people that he thought and to, to say on the media that he thought his family was involved, um, Wendy had to decide, is it Rob or is it mom, dad and Charlie? And for her, it's always been mom, dad and Charlie. Mm -hmm. I see. OK. Um... Let me and see. By the way, he is the one who doesn't want to have anything to do. Rob doesn't want to have anything to do with his family because of the fact that he knows that they were involved in Dan Markell's murder. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, let me try to. Oh, everybody wants to know why. Why did Wendy wear that same dress? I have the answer. And I was actually asked. I don't know if it's going to be broadcast on the Dateline interview, but I have the answer. And it's okay. exactly what happened to me. I did not. I was not there for Wendy's testimony because uh, I wasn't there during the first week. So I, of course, went to YouTube uh, to find her testimony. And the first thing that I saw was Wendy in that dress. And what's the first thought that popped into my head? This is the same way Wendy played with me in the email exchange with me. She played with the whole world by wearing that dress. What's the first thing that popped in my head? Oh, this isn't this isn't this week. This is from two years ago. So I don't need to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then I finally figured out, no, it says May 2022 that she was wearing the same dress. And so she was wearing the same dress. She was wearing the same black blazer. But I study all details very closely. She was wearing different earrings. That's the way you can tell whether it's 2022 or 2019. Well, but the hair is a little frothier looking by 20. Yeah, but, but in terms of her attire, her earrings were different. She did that to mess with people, in my view. Um, and I, I've heard other people say the same thing. So that when people saw that and are very familiar with the case, they would assume that's not the 2022 trial. That's the 2019 trial. I won't bother looking at it. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Yeah, I, I think some people that have been really following the case thought that also, you know, that it was to confuse people and make them less likely to watch the new trial testimony, thinking it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Wait, let me see. What team did Wendy's parents want Wendy on? That means Harvey knew if you are now saying Wendy's parents wanted to be sure she was on their side. Remember, Charlie was not at the church service. Well, it was a memorial service. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, part of me is still leaning towards thinking that Harvey probably knew or was sort of in on it on the plot, because I, I just don't really buy it that Katie would just happen to have her, you know, friends with benefits <laughs> guys, like father's personal cell phone number. That just seems kind of weird. Well, remember um, they were, they were girlfriend and boyfriend for an extensive period of time. They were girlfriend and boyfriend starting right. in the fall of 2013. 13. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that was exclusive. true. Um, no one was ever exclusive. Charlie Adelson was never exclusive. And of course, when uh, Katie admitted that she was still having sex with Garcia, even though she had kicked him out of the house. Um, but no, they were they were an item and they went all kinds of places together and they spent a lot of time with Donna and Harvey. So it's not terribly surprising that they had contact, that she had contact information for Harvey. Hmm. 
Okay. But um, and that call was explained by Katie herself. So Katie herself from the witness stand explained that the call on July the 1st that both she and Garcia made had to do with the altercation that occurred earlier that day when Garcia drove his Volvo uh, just near where, with the kids in the car and basically went out of the car and started screaming at Charlie, who was driving um, his Lexus with the jet ski on the back um, and was screaming at him because he was he didn't want Charlie, the rich dentist, dating his girl, his wife. Mm -hmm. I see. OK. OK. Uh, what about this comment? Wendy pulled the strings in the police station as she did with her family. Remember, she kept asking who would do this until her friend said, oh, how about Jeffrey? But she mentioned her mom and dad and she mentioned her brother incessantly throughout the interview. So that's the bizarre thing is that if Wendy was, you know, putting on an act and trying to throw um, throw Isom off the track, why did she keep mentioning her family members as being the ones who had the most reason to want Danny out of the way mm -hmm. and how angry they were with him? And it was obvious. I mean, at that point, she had no idea that um, they were going to eventually have their hands on Donna's emails. I mean, she's she's learning about at least the police having found Dan shot in his garage. She's learning about that right there at the police station. And mm -hmm. you know, the, the notion that she had carefully scripted all of these things. Well, if she was so careful to script them, why is she implicating her family over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. I see. Although she also claimed that she she didn't think her family would do anything like this. And I think she was hoping that her family because that if you watch what she says after she hangs up the phone, I'm really glad they seem surprised is what she said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I couldn't handle anything like that right now. She said yeah. that I yeah. couldn't handle anything like that right now. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, totally Why didn't Sigfredo give up Charlie? Because I don't think Sigfredo knew that Charlie was involved in this. I don't mm -hmm. think he knew at all. And I think he would have. And that's that's what I say in the book. I think he would have raced to the state attorney's office to get himself out of a potential death sentence uh, if he had the goods on Charlie Adelson. And I think Sam Zangana is a very good defense attorney. If Sigfredo Garcia had the goods on Charlie Adelson, it is just unfathomable to me that he wouldn't have given up Charlie Adelson and gotten a very good deal. I mean, all Garcia, all uh, Rivera gave up was Sigfredo Garcia and mm -hmm. Katie Magdanawa. He didn't give up the you know, the masterminds, he gave up the low hanging fruit and he got a, you know, a, just six and a half years added to his sentence. So there was a very good deal for Garcia if he had, had the goods on Garcia, which is why the defense theory in the second trial that this was a tight knit conspiracy between Garcia and and uh, Charlie Adelson just made no sense. He would have run yeah. to the state attorney's office to get himself a deal if he had the goods on Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And similarly, why do you think Katie didn't take a plea and flip? That that's the million dollar question, and it's hard to know and explain. Georgia Kappelman was dared by uh, Tara Kawas to explain that. You know, she's innocent. You know, otherwise, why would she sit in jail for six years? She's obviously innocent. Something's going on that we don't know about exactly what it is. You know, are they? you know, taking care of these kids to the point that they're going to have as much money as they want for the rest of their lives. You know, they're living with uh, Katie's brother, Francis. He's actually a well, fairly well-to-do guy himself. He's in the financial planning world. Um, but, um, you know, it could be that there's all kinds of benefits and it could be that, you know, maybe there's been threats made that if Katie flips, who knows who's going to get hurt? Who knows? Uh, but mm -hmm. there are clearly reasons other than the fact, I mean, it's the evidence against her is overwhelming too. Uh, and she had very good lawyers. There was a reason she didn't flip. Uh, and it's not because she's innocent. Mm -hmm. And similarly, everybody keeps asking who paid for Katie's lawyers. Do you have an opinion on that? I don't have any insight. I know that Judge Hankinson looked at enough information to say that there wasn't an issue there and the, the, that the prosecution wasn't going to get any of those records. Judge Hankinson in the first trial looked at that information in camera. Um, certainly there is money within the family. Francis has some money. So how much money came from the family and how much came from other sources, I don't know. Um, and, you know, it is an odd coincidence that uh, Charlie Adelson's first attorney, David Marcus, was in the same building as um, Krista Coast or Tara Kawas. I can't remember which one of them, but one of them is in the same building as um, Charlie's first lawyer. But I, I, I don't know. I just don't know um, who was funding Katie. She clearly had 
a very significant amount of money laid out for those attorneys who poured themselves into her case from 2016 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so did you hear about her former sister-in-law being yes. put in yes. prison? Well, I, for I, I'm not sure that I did it all. I've heard it on shows like yours mm -hmm. and others that her former sister-in-law was arrested and actually uh, convicted Sentence. of some kind of embezzlement of a embezzlement of a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I think Kawas mentioned something about Katie's mother having life insurance or some sort of inheritance that they might have gotten out for after and she, and she died shortly after Katie's arrest. So there could have been money there. I don't know. Yes. OK, well, this is a quick, easy question. Can somebody in Spain buy your book? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but it's not. Nobody can buy it yet because I'm still I literally was edit working on edits with my publisher just before I went on this show. It's uh, it's not yet ready for prime time, but come late September, uh, it'll be available on Amazon. So wherever you can get Amazon, you can get my book. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, another question about Katie. Do you think there's any chance Katie would cooperate? I, I don't think so. I think she's dug herself into a hole telling everybody she's innocent. Let me play devil's advocate. I, I certainly think there's a possibility, and I definitely believe that the, the state attorney's office would be all ears to hear what Katie McDonough has to say. I mean, that's the reason they never arrested Charlie Edelson. They wanted Katie to flip so that they would get the inside story of everything that, because she's the one who knows about Charlie, not Rivera, not Garcia. It's Katie who knows about uh, Charlie Adelson. She was the conduit. She was the one who he was having a relationship with. And she knows she, he came to her and said, I've got to get this thing done. So she has all kinds of information that as good as the work that uh, both law enforcement and the state attorney's office has done to this point, they don't have and they would love to get it. They don't need necessarily Katie to get on the witness stand to testify because there's things that they can get to in other ways, but they need the leads of knowing what she can supply about what Charlie was doing in the weeks and months before the murder and what Charlie was doing in the weeks and months after the murder. Remember the wiretap didn't even begin until April of 2016, which was nearly two years after the murder. Katie would know these things and they would she would be able to give um, the state attorney's office, a roadmap in much greater detail about Charlie than Rivera was able to give about all the ele other elements of the case. So she'd be a valuable resource, even if her, you know, her sworn testimony from the prior two trials makes her a bad witness, she would still be a tremendously valuable resource. So I don't, I don't think it's out of the question at all that there could be a deal down the road where Katie would supply information to the state attorney's office in exchange for some kind of reduced sentence from her lifetime sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Okay, um, just another random question. Um, did Wendy plan the school choice meeting with Dan that day in order to keep Dan's timeline tight? No, that day was very fluid. So you know, the, what she's talking about is where Ben was gonna go to kindergarten. And Dan was actually furious that um, when he, he was in New York, came back from New York and learned uh, by getting a call that um, that uh, Ben had been enrolled at uh, a, call, a school called School of the Arts, um, which was a charter school for kindergarten, which he got in through a lottery and Dan knew nothing about it. And he was livid. He was livid that Wendy had gone behind his back and in, enrolled uh, their son while they were still having discussions about where Ben was going to go to kindergarten. She took matters into her own hands, which she didn't have a right to do under their marital settlement agreement. And, and put in for the lottery. And Dan found out, not from Wendy, but from the school that Ben had been admitted. And that was what was going on in those, those couple of days before the murder, where Dan is trying to figure out, we got to figure out what's going on here and figure out what's happening with Ben. Um, and they didn't have any meeting time set. They were going to talk. And there was an exchange of voicemails between the two of them where they were trying to arrange a time to talk. Um, and Dan was killed before then. Ironically, uh, Dan was on the phone with a music teacher at the School of the Arts um, at the time he was killed. That was the that was the night. The, there were two 911 calls. One was from Jim Geiger's next door neighbor, and one was from um, this guy's. Um, I can't Stewart. remember Stewart, somebody Stewart, uh, Stuart Schlazer. Schlazer. Schlazer, yeah, who um, was the music teacher. And Dan was trying to get information from him about, well, should I consider this school? Um, and he said, hold on one second. There's someone in my driveway that's not familiar with me. It turned out to be either Sigfredo Garcia or Luis Rivera, 
who pointed a gun at the window and shot him and killed him. Mm -hmm. I see. But there was no preordained meeting time for Dan and Wendy to meet that day. They were going to speak by phone, and it was a very fluid day. And then Dan was actually supposed to pick up the boys early from preschool uh, and take them swimming before the transition time, which was another little brouhaha between him and Wendy, because Wendy wanted to get the kids and didn't want Dan to have him have them for swimming. Mm, okay. Yeah, a lot of contention there. Um, okay, so why did Wendy want to know when Jeff was leaving town? Because, you know, a lot of people still think that Wendy had a hand in plotting this because it seemed like she was sort of trying to set up Jeff. So why would she want to know details right after breaking up with him? Like, uh, when are you leaving again on Friday? You know? Their breakup was very fluid. And in fact, uh, the, the first thing that, um, the very first thing that um, Jeff Lacoste says when he sits down with not Ison but another investigator was, I really am very reluctant to talk because there's still a very good chance that Wendy and I are going to get back together again. I don't want any of this coming back to her. So their their breakup was not this you know clear we're done. Wendy was taking a break from him. That's what her email to him said, and it wasn't clear they were forever not going to be a couple again. Um, so that's been overplayed a lot that there was this breakup and they were never seeing each other again. In fact, Wendy was still talking to him after the murder. Uh, and that's how we know about the celebration. Celebration. Right? Yeah. So I'm I'm unfortunately going to have to call a timeout. Maybe we'll get to do this again. <laughs> sure. Uh, yes. And I know we can keep talking about these things forever. But yes. hopefully I've sparked a little bit of interest about some of the things that I talked about that you can continue talking with your audience about in the weeks and months ahead. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and everything. I mean, this is this is just such a very, very captivating real life story. So yeah. I think that's why we have so many people tuning in everything. But I'll definitely let you go. And I hope people out there are still intrigued enough to please purchase Stephen Epstein's book I'm as soon as it's available. The book cover right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, great, great. Did you do that yourself? No, the publisher did that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I didn't we went know. round and round and round on exact. And to me, it was really important that the bullet hole right there be right smack dab in the center of the cover. That yeah. was really important to me. Yes. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much. I, I know this book has taken you years to put together and you've talked to so many sources. And I mean, just based on my reading of the rough draft, it, it seemed like a very captivating book that I think, you know, everybody should read. So I, I know Thank some you. people are kind of, you know, getting upset because they, they truly believe that Wendy had a hand in plotting the murder. Um, but we'll, we'll be sure to, you know, absorb all the details in your book and come to our own conclusions. And yeah. absolutely. I don't, I, just mm -hmm. because I've written the book, you know, the so-called book doesn't mean I have all the answers either. Um, yeah. And you certainly get a lot of conflicting information when you're writing a book like this and you have to pick the information that seems most logical to you. There's nothing in this book that says Wendy didn't do it. Not at all. I simply lay out everything that happened in a narrative form and readers can make up their own mind. I do not want ever to tell readers what happened. I want them to make up their own mind based upon the full story. And I just try and tell the full story. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so it's been so long. So I would like to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, please Take a look at Ruth Markell's book, The Unveiling, which is already available for pre-order. And Steve Epstein's book will be available towards the middle to late part of September, also on Amazon. So thank you for your time, Steve. And thank we'll go ahead and end me. the live broadcast and uh, we'll just uh, stay on for a second or so.